20. Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 20. <clears throat> Beginning in verse 1, the Bible says, And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria, and all went to be taxed, everyone into his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth unto Judea, unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. Ye shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel and a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. It came to pass as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, Let us now go even unto Bethlehem and see this thing which is come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. When they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all they that heard it wondered at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told them. You may be seated. You know, of course, that on Sunday nights, I've been doing a series of messages. I've just been preaching on amazing stories of the Bible. And I got that idea months and months ago, uh, maybe not the first of the year, but, uh, but close to that, to just, I got a series of children's Bible stories and, and um, went through those, those stories, that, you know, and, and, and found an outline, wrote down an order to follow through. And, and I wanted to preach the, 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 the amazing stories of the Bible that you'd find in children's Bible stories book, The Amazing Stories of the Bible and What They Mean Today. It was my uh, concept, my idea, and so I wrote down that list, and, and uh, I've been working through this list and this, of amazing stories of the Bible through the year until I came to this week, and I pulled out my list, and, uh, and uh, wouldn't you know it, uh, the message for tonight is um, on the birth of the baby. And I just think it's wonderful that it happened this first Sunday night. Now, my wife, she's a little bit, I don't know if this is more spiritual, less spiritual, or what it is. She said, why couldn't she wait until, um, she, she says she's more spiritual. Why couldn't she yeah. wait until Christmas? <laughs> she says she's more, she's telling me right now, more spiritual. And she, and she, why couldn't you wait for Christmas? Well, because I think Christmas starts about right now. And so, uh, and uh, you know, who wants a short Christmas? We want a long time. Anyway, so, uh, uh, and so I was, I was thankful for this, uh, to be able to do this tonight. And so what I did is I just, you know, it, now um, I decided, because it's uh, amazing stories of the Bible and what they mean today, and it would be uh, the birth of the Lord. And so I chose, I just decided, you know, that any kind of message that would fit for Christmas would work for tonight. And so um, I'm not going to bring a message that has to do with the virgin birth and all of the what it, all the implications of that. I want to bring tonight um, a, a, a message that has to do with the reactions of men and women at the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, one of the most amazing things about Jesus leaving heaven, I think, and becoming a man and to die in the place of man is the reaction that people have concerning that truth, not only back then, but today, the, the reaction that people have when they hear that God became man and dwelt among us, when they hear that God himself uh, became a man and he lived a sinless life and he, uh, and he died a, a substitutionary death and, and he rose victorious over the grave and that he lives in heaven today and that he wants all men and all women to be saved. One of the most amazing things about that story is, that, is the reactions that people have uh, to the message of the, of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says in John chapter 1 and verse 11, He came unto His own. Isn't that amazing? He came unto His own, but then it says, And His own received Him not. 
God became man. And man rejected him. In fact, Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 3, he is despised and rejected of man, uh, uh, re re despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. How is it that God became man and man would despise him? How is it that that could possibly be the case that Almighty God who uh, loved us enough that instead of annihilating mankind at the entrance of sin, chose instead before the foundations of the world to uh, come up with a plan that you and I might be forgiven of our sins and saved and that we would reject the plan. Isn't it an amazing thing? So what I want to do tonight is I want to give you, I uh, want to show you five different people. They're all very familiar. Five different people uh, and, uh, tonight who are found in the Bible and the different attitudes of these five people concerning the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, con concerning their, their reactions when Christ was born. We're going to begin tonight with the innkeeper. We're going to be in Matthew, I mean in Luke chapter 2 one, uh, and then in Matthew also uh, 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 here as we get along and away. So you're going to want to kind of have uh, Matthew chapter 1 and 2 and Luke chapter 2 kind of uh, marked because we're going to kind of go back and forth with them. We're going to start with the, with the innkeeper of Bethlehem in Luke chapter 2 and verse 7. And she brought forth her son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Now there's some speculation that has to go on here about this, what takes place in this passage, why the innkeeper, why there's no room for them in the inn. And, but one of the first things that comes to mind is there's, if there's an inn, there's got to be an innkeeper. And if there's an innkeeper, he must have been the one who said, uh, no room here. No room in the end. And so we're going to call him tonight. His attitude is one that there's, he's got, he's too busy. He's got too much on his plate to deal with um, this little baby being born in Bethlehem at the time. So the end can be viewed, when we think about the end, it can be viewed in a couple of different ways because of the culture of those days and so forth. First of all, this would have been his home. This would have been the innkeeper's home. Those days they didn't have motel sixes or even um, holiday inns. They didn't have anything like that. And uh, if a traveler was coming through, it was expected that there were people in town who would open up their homes and that they would provide places for uh, hospitality, provide places for people to stay and um, and that must have been what this was is that this is someone who lives in this home and he opens his home for travelers as they come through town and for people who come and maybe it might be that because of the season there's an unusual thing happening here they're being called to come to Bethlehem for a taxing people whose families were historically from Bethlehem have to come there for a census for a taxing and it might be that uh, that they're under these unusual uh, uh, unusual uh, conditions that there are other people who who've uh, opened up their homes that wouldn't maybe normally do so. But at this, we do know this, that the innkeeper's home, it would, or the innkeeper, this would have been his home, so he can view it as his house, but we can also see it as his business. He's going to make some income here. And, uh, you know, a person oftentimes will do that when they see a need. You want to help people out. But if you can make a buck helping them out, that's pretty good too. And, and uh, so that kind of a thing happening, you know. Uh, and, and so you can look at it as both a, his home and his business. And when you think about that, you know, most people today, and, and maybe that sounds negative, but when you look at what happens in the world around us, not only in America, but when you put the world in general together, most people have no room for Christ in their home right. and in their life. Yeah. Most people. It's less than 2% of the people of the world who claim any kind of Christianity, and it's far less than that, who know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. So it's not at all difficult to say, difficult to say that most people in the world today have no room for Christ in their home, no room for Christ in their life. They don't want Christ to mess up how they live. They don't want Christ to influence how they, things go on in their house and in their home. Most people are like that, but if it's true that most people don't want Jesus in their home, It'd be uh, true also that far fewer people have room for Christ in their business. Yeah. I mean, they don't want him to influence their private life, but he certainly isn't going to influence their business life and the way they earn their living. And, and, and so the innkeeper, he's got no room for Jesus. I think it's a selfish attitude. He's got kind of a selfish attitude here. And, he, and besides this selfish attitude, the innkeeper's problem is that he failed to recognize the treasure that's, that's in his 
in his stable that night. This isn't just another birth. This isn't just another baby. He had the opportunity to invite into his home the answer to every problem sinful man ever faces. But he was too busy. He's too full of work. He's too blinded by the activities that he's involved in to see what a treasure stays, is there with him. Is that ever your problem and mine? That we're so busy with life and we're so, uh, so, so, so full of activity that we, we fail to see the opportunities to, uh, to, 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 to invite Christ into our life or to be used of the Lord in some way to be a blessing or to help to someone else in our, in our lives. <clears throat> this is the way it is with all of those who've never received Christ as Savior. They view Christ as just a, another of the many religions that are in the world. You know, uh, like the innkeeper, there's just, this is just one more baby. I can't provide a place for every baby. It's just one more baby. If I can't provide a place for every baby, I might as well not provide a place for this baby. It's not a family that looks like they can provide for, oper you know, any financial ability for me. So no reason for me to do. And I think so oftentimes we look at that same, we look at uh, people, look at uh, those who are lost, look at Christianity that way as well. It's just one more religion. If I'm not interested in Buddhism, if I'm not is interested in Islam, if I'm not interested in Hinduism, why would I be interested in Christianity? I'm not interested in Judaism. Why would I be interested in Christianity? It's just one of the many religions that's in the world today. They view Christ as just another one of those religions. They see Christ as just another one of those many prophets and teachers the world has known. Some of them good and some of them bad. And anymore, people aren't thinking Christ was so good. Um, you know, when I first became a Christian, I, I remember someone telling me, you know, that every, uh, every war in the world has got a religious background. And when they mean that, they mean a Christian background. And, uh, and you know, there's arguments back and forth. But now they don't, now it used to be they just say that I'm not interested in religion because religions start wars. Now they're saying I'm not interested in Christianity because you people start wars. I don't know that you won't be. And, and they look at us as a threat, those of us who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. They look at Christ much the same way sometimes as they would look at, someone else would look at maybe Plato or Socrates. You know, just a philosopher, just a guy who's got some ideas. And they don't see Christ as who he is, God incarnate, the one who is, the, uh, who is able to take away the sin of the world. Jesus is so much more than a prophet or a philosopher. John the Baptist, 30 years after Jesus' birth, saw Jesus there and said, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. I, and I want to urge you tonight, don't think of Christ as common. And don't think of your faith as common. Don't allow yourself to fall into the trap of thinking being saved is just a, a, a common thing. Or being coming to the Bi or, or reading your Bible or, uh, uh, or attending a church service is just ordinary stuff. Don't think of this as ordinary. Don't think of it as just day to day. Don't think of it as just this is what I do. I go to church and I leave and I go back home and I earn my living and, and I earn, um, eat my meals and then on come Sunday I go back to church and it's just that way day in and day out. I don't know why it's that way. It's just that way. I read my Bible because my preacher makes me feel guilty if I don't read my Bible and, and all of that kind of stuff and I'm saved because someone told me I ought to be saved uh, and, and that kind of thing. No, think of, realize the supernatural origin of what God has done for you. The miracle that is your salvation and the, uh, and the infallibility of your Bible and the, and the supernatural element that's involved in attending a church service. These are, these are things where, this is where heavenly work is accomplished. Think of it that way. The innkeeper, he's just too busy, too focused on himself, to really think of Jesus as much a, as much a, uh, as anything more than just an ordinary thing. But then there's uh, King Herod, and he's going to be found in Matthew chapter 2, if you want to turn there. Matthew chapter 2, and I'm just going to read verse 13 to you. The Bible says, when they departed, the wise men, when they departed, uh, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise and take the young child and Mary and his mother and flee into Egypt, and be thou there until I bring thee word. And then it says this, for Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. Now, Herod's um, attitude toward Jesus and reaction toward Jesus is he sees him as a threat. He sees him as a threat. Matthew chapter 2 and verse 3, when Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled. 
His attitude is one of being troubled. He was troubled in all Jerusalem with him. Jerusalem's troubled because if the king's upset, uh, ain't nobody, uh, like the, in the house, if the wife ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. In Jerusalem, if a king ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. And uh, if Herod ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. And, and uh, no, it's no wonder that, that Herod would have felt threatened by the news that the, the king of Israel had been born. There's no wonder uh, that he's threatened by that because the fact is he's got no rightful place to be king in Israel anyway, in Jerusalem anyway. The, he was a phony king. Uh, he was a, a bully who ruled by force. Uh, he was not a pure Jew. He was only half Jew. Uh, he was not of the royal family. That wasn't where his lineage came from. He was appointed by Rome and not by the Jews even. This man is a phony king. He's got no right to the throne in Jerusalem at all. And so all of a sudden news comes out that one who is born from the Fright family, one who is ordained of God to be the king has been born. No wonder he is threatened by that. He sees Jesus as a rival authority to his own. And you know, that's exactly how Satan sees Jesus. He's a rival to the, to the authority that Satan has. The devil has absolutely no right to claim authority except that people allow Satan to lead them. <clears throat> the only authority the devil has is the authority that men give him or that man has given him. Adam and Eve and in the garden and Satan comes, a serpent subtly comes up and says, Yea, hath God said? God's already given them instructions. And they chose to deny the instructions of God and to follow the enticement of the, of the serpent there who is the devil. The, any authority the devil has is, a, is authority that man has given him and not authority that he has on his own. He offers to Jesus the kingdoms of this world. And Jesus doesn't not deny that he can do that. But the only reason the devil has any authority in the kingdoms of this world is because men give him the authority. Men follow him rather than God. Is the only reason. So when Jesus came, the devil recognized right away that Jesus had the potential to take from him the authority that he had over men. And inspired by the devil, Herod sought to destroy Jesus before he could establish the authority, before he could, Jesus could establish authority on this earth. And then the natural man, not only does, devil, does the devil see Jesus as a rival authority, but the natural man sees Jesus as a rival authority too and is threatened by, by, the, by the authority of Christ. Again, when Adam and Eve ate that fruit in the garden, Satan said, if you'll eat this fruit, you'll become, he didn't say you eat this fruit, I'll become your God. That's not what the devil did. I don't think most people would have bought that. I don't think Adam and Eve would have, Eve, would, I don't think she would have bought it if, uh, if the serpent would have said, even, no matter how subtle he was, if he had said, you eat this fruit and I get to be your God, I don't think that would have enticed Eve a whole lot. But that's not what he said. He said, the day you eat this fruit, you'll become God. And the fact of the matter is, you and I bear in our bodies the, the nature of sin that just wants to be its own God. We want to decide for ourselves what's right and wrong and what's good and evil. And, and, and ever since Adam and Eve ate that fruit, and ever since uh, and their first child was born with the sin nature, and it's gone through us, and so that we're born with the sin nature, we are repulsed by, as human beings, we are repulsed by the authority of God in our lives. And your flesh and mine is naturally inclined to disobey the Lord rather than hear and obey him and so um, we're threatened you talk to people about Jesus one of the first things people say when you talk to people is I'm going to have to change you go and you share the gospel with them and you show them how to be saved and one of the first things they're going to say is wait a minute what is this going to mean to my life what am I going to have to change this mean I have to go to church all the time. This mean, and they'll, all this kind of stuff that they'll, they'll start throwing in. Wait a minute, do, what do I have to change? Am I going to have to give up anything? Because they've already got their life planned and they wouldn't mind getting saved. They wouldn't mind God not, for, not ignoring their sin. And they wouldn't mind going to heaven when they die. They just mind the fact that they've got an authority in their life other than their own. That's the problem they have. That's the problem you have, me. Day, it, Paul said, I die daily. What was he saying? He was saying, I had to die every single day. He's saying, I have to make a choice that God's authority rules, not mine. Every one of us fight this. Repulsed by the authority of God, threatened by the authority of God in our lives. So uh, the innkeeper, he's just too busy. 
Herod, he's threatened. Uh, he sees Jesus' arrival authority in his life. Thirdly, there's the shepherds, though. We're going to get into some better stuff now. There's the shepherds. Look at verses uh, 15 through 17, Luke chapter 2, verses 15 through 17. It came to pass as the angels were gone away from them into heaven. The shepherds said one to another, let us now go even unto Bethlehem and see this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning the child. And we'll just stop right there, I guess, in, for our reading here. So the shepherds, I'm going to say, I'm going to call it their attitude, their response, their reaction is one of faith. They believe. They have faith. They believed the word of the angels concerning the Lord Jesus Christ. And I think there's at least three ways that their faith is demonstrated in this passage of Scripture. And faith can be demonstrated, probably there's more than this, but at least three ways that I see. Number one, I noticed that they came personally to see Jesus. When the angels told them that, that the Savior had come, when the angels told them that the one who was the king of the Jews had come, when the angels announced the birth to the to the, uh, to the shepherds, they didn't say, well, that's pretty good news and sit around and drink coffee. The Bible says they per came personally to see this born, this baby who was born. You know, so many people in our world today kind of claim to believe in Jesus. Uh, uh, and, and, and it's changing, I know. But, it, but over the years of my life, uh, most of the people that I speak to, most of the people that I know, whether they're Christians or not, whether they're church people or not, most of the people I know would say, well, yes, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a Christian. I believe, I believe in Christ. I believe in his death and his burial and his resurrection. They claim to believe in Jesus, but there's nothing personal about, uh, about it for them. That's how I was until I was, uh, until I was uh, 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 18 years old. And uh, when, uh, when, uh, when as, a, as a kid, I believed in, his, in Jesus and I believed in the death and the burial and the resurrection of the Lord. I'd just never gotten saved. I'd never gone to church. It wasn't something my family did. And um, I'd never once considered that Jesus ought to uh, not only be my Savior, but they ought to have some influence in how I live my life and how I think and how I speak and the things that I do. Never once had thought about those kind of things. I'd have said that I believed in Jesus. I'd have said that. But I didn't live like that. And I certainly didn't know him personally as my Savior. And that's how most people are. They, they claim to believe in him, but they don't have any faith in him. He's not personal to them. They don't personally read the Bible. They don't personally pray to the Lord. They don't personally attend services. They don't personally seek to follow the Lord's will. And they haven't ever personally come to the Lord and asked him to forgive their sins and, and, and save them. And the shepherds didn't just hear about Jesus. Didn't just accept the message of the angels. They came to meet Jesus personally. Do you know Christ personally? I mean, I know you come to church and I know you hear preaching and I, and, and I know that you'd say that you believe in Jesus, but if you, do you, have, has there been a time in your life where you came to see Jesus yourself? Not only did they come, but the Bible says they came in haste. Not only did they come, but they did it in haste. They got right up and got busy. You know, an evidence that a person has a genuine and personal faith is that they obey the Lord and they do it without hesitation. Now, I didn't say that if you hesitate, you're not saved. I didn't say that. Most of us in here uh, have had a time in our life where we knew what God wanted for our life, but we hesitated. And there is that that happens. But I am saying tonight that if you obey without hesitation, it's a pretty strong indication that you're, that, uh, uh, that you're a believer, that your faith is genuine. If you obey without hesitation, without question, just here's what God says, I'm going to do it. Uh, that's a pretty strong indication that, you're, that your faith is genuine. It doesn't mean that your faith is genuine and that you hesitate sometimes doesn't mean that your faith is not genuine. But, when you, but, but, but it's an indicator if uh, you hear the word of God and you, respond and, uh, and you respond immediately, it's a pretty good indication your faith is genuine. No hesitations, no questions, no arguing with God, just going to do what God says. Then not only that, one of the evidences is that they came personally. One of the evidences is that they, 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 they came with haste. They came immediately. They came quickly. Another evidence is, is that after they saw Jesus, they went and told someone else. The Bible says they told others. You know, the Bible is filled with passages telling believers to witness, uh, to confess with our mouths, uh, to, be, to testify, uh, to go show, to go tell 
The Bible is filled with verses that tell us that we ought to speak about the Lord Jesus Christ. And it, it's, there are so many verses that talk about that, that it's difficult to conceive of a genuine Christian who doesn't tell others. It's difficult, at least from a biblical point of view, it's difficult to believe that there is such a thing as a Christian who's quiet about it. As a genuinely saved person who doesn't want to tell other people about it. I'm not saying that you're Billy Graham or that you're Billy Graham. Billy Sunday, or I wouldn't, I don't want you to be Billy Graham. Billy Sunday might be a little bit different, but uh, Billy, Billy Sunday, or I'm not saying that you have to be an evangelist and, you know, win a million people, Lord, in your lifetime or something like that. But every Christian ought to want to tell somebody about the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you can be satisfied saying, I'm a believer, but uh, no one else has to be, there's just something wrong with that, that kind of a faith. And the shepherds, they went out and told, you know, in fact, the Bible's filled with stories where Jesus told people, don't go and tell. And they did anyway. Because you can't not talk about it if it's real in your life. The shepherds, their attitude is one of faith. The, uh, King Herod, his attitude is one of being threatened by the Lord. Uh, the innkeeper, his attitude, he's just too busy, too self-centered, too caught up in himself uh, to, get, uh, to see the opportunity that Jesus provides for him. And then we're going to go to the wise men in Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. Now, when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, <clears throat> Behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. I'm going to skip down to verse 11. And when they were come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother and fell down and worshipped him. And when they opened their treasures, they presented unto him gold and frankincense and, the, and myrrh. And I'm doing this because I don't, you know, five points of the messages can be forever for me. So I'm trying to get done in a reasonable amount of time tonight. And uh, so uh, the the wise men. Now, the wise men, I think their attitude, uh, they have an attitude. This isn't really an attitude, but this is just, I didn't know how else to say it. Their attitude, they're followers of Christ. They're followers. They followed, and a few things about their, their, their walk with the Lord that I think is interesting. They followed what they knew to be the Word of God. Now, the, the, they said, Here's, where is he that's born, uh, uh, born king of the Jews? We've seen his star in the east, and we've come to worship him. So somehow they related this star that they saw to the birth of a king in Jerusalem or in Israel. Somehow they related that and, and, uh, and, and they knew there was going to be a king that was born in, in, to the Jews. And they knew that there would be a star that would be the sign uh, of this king that was born uh, of the Jews. Now, how did they know that? Well, at least one passage that they may have uh, seen from the Word of God is Numbers chapter 24 and verse 17. The Bible says, I shall see him, but not now. I shall behold him, but not nigh. There shall come a star out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel, and shall smite the corners of Moab and destroy all the children of Seth. And so um, the Bible speaks about a star. There'll come a star out of Jacob. And, and there's at least one passage, other passages that called Jesus a bright and morning star, and some other passages like that. But the question would be, well, these are wise men from the east, probably Babylon, the area of Babylon and Persia, that kind of area. And how in the world would they have known Bible passages to know that a star was going to come from the east and how they would know that there was going to be a star that represented a king born to the Jews? How would they know that? And, and the Bible, you know, the, I think I mentioned this last week in the message, the Bible doesn't answer every question we have. You and I are filled with endless questions. The Bible doesn't answer every question we have, and so we don't have every answer to every question we have. And one of the questions we, that we might have is, well, where did, how did they know about the star, and how did they know about Jesus? And in my opinion, this is my opinion, and not mine only, but one, my opinion is that Daniel had taught the wise men Hundreds of years previous to this, when Daniel was counted as one of the wise men of the East, he's, he's captured out of Jerusalem, he's taken to Babylon, he's trained up to be a leader in the nation of Babylon, he becomes one of the wise men for, of Babylon and serves under at least three kings and probably more than that when you start looking into it, probably more than three kings. He serves under as a wise man under, wise man under three kings and works with other wise men and very likely Daniel, who is a believer and can't keep his mouth closed, 
closed about being a believer. He's one who believes and he understands when you believe, you talk about what you believe. And Daniel talks and he's a wise man talking to wise men and he's shared with the wise men hundreds of years previous to this that there's going to be a king born in Israel that God has promised a king. In fact, he prophesies that there, that there will be a stone cut without hands. It'll come from heaven and it'll uh, destroy the, the, the uh, kingdoms of this world and will establish a kingdom from God. And, uh, and Daniel is prob- uh, no doubt has, has told these things to the wise men and they wise, these wise men have carried on that message from century to century to century until finally there comes a day. You know, wise men don't change their doctrines. Wise men don't have to write a new Bible every hundred years. Amen. Wise men don't need to uh, see if they can tweak and change and adjust and, and, and make the word of God a little bit more palatable to their day. Wise men just say, this is the word of God and I'm going to stick with the word of God. And I don't know that these wise men are that wise, but it looks to me like they're wise enough that for hundreds of years, these people have heard a message that came from Daniel and they didn't change the message. They just told the next generation of wise men who told the next generation of wise men who told the next generation of wise men until there was a generation of wise men who saw the star. Knew what it represented and made their way to Jerusalem. Began to follow that star to find the one who was to be born king of the Jews. Now, another thing about these wise men then, uh, that's interesting, their walk here. So they leave probably the area of Babylon and they're coming from the east. That is, that's very likely them when the Bible always speaks about the east. It had been Persia, Babylon, that area. And they've made, this is a, this is a long trip on camel and donkey and on foot. This is a very long trip that they've taken. Um, uh, weeks and weeks have gone by as they've traveled. And, and, uh, and as, as, they're, as they're following the star, and there comes a day, the star disappears. They don't get discouraged <coughs> when the star disappears. And just say, oh, well, well, we thought this was the right thing to do, but obviously it must not be, and, and change the way. They didn't... When the star disappeared, they just started asking questions until they got some answers. And when the star appeared again, they were glad. Can I just tell you, uh, that would be a pretty wise thing to do when, you, isn't there, haven't you had times in your Christian faith, and you're walking with the Lord, and you feel like you've got answers, you feel like you've got direction, things are going pretty good, and then all of a sudden, your star disappears? <laughs> God, what am I supposed to do now? I mean, I've gotten out here and I'm, a, you know, away from home and I've committed myself to this thing. And now I don't know, what do I do now? Where do I go now? And, and uh, things that worked in your past aren't working right now, that kind of stuff. Here's the thing. Just don't quit. Don't decide, you know, well, if I'm not going to have a star for the rest of my path, I'm just going to choose a different path. Don't quit. Don't just keep doing what you know to do until God <coughs> gives you more directions. Just keep on. Sometimes it does happen where uh, the star disappears in your life, where it just seems like you read the Bible, you're not sure what the, where the answers are, or things that are happening, circumstances in your life are such that you're not really sure what the next step is. Well, if you don't know what the next step is, just keep doing what you've been doing for God. Don't ask, you know, don't uh, ask, ask questions and seek uh, answers and pray and seek uh, answers and from the Lord. Just keep doing what you know to do. Keep reading your Bible. Keep praying. Keep attending church. Keep serving. Serving Lord, keep witnessing to people, just keep doing what you've always done, and one of these days the star will appear again. The directions come back, and just keep doing what you're supposed to do. So many people today are doing this thing. Well, it seemed like our star disappeared, and so we found another star. It seemed like we didn't know how to do where to go anymore, and so we found someone else who they seemed like they knew, and so we began following them, and it's a different direction. Too many people are doing those. The other thing I notice about these wise men, they're walking with the Lord. They're following Christ. They're following the star to Christ. And, uh, um, and so, and then they, they, when they, the star disappears, they don't get discouraged. But the third thing that I notice about them is they, bought, they brought gifts to bring to the king, which tells me that their walk with the Lord is one that, that is filled with love and adoration and worship. It's not forced. They're not, um, they're, they're not walking with the Lord because they have to walk with the Lord. 
they're not walking with the Lord because they have no idea what else to do. They're not walking with the Lord because some king back home told them to walk with the Lord or because this guy over here, if they stop walking with the Lord, this guy's going to get mad at them. They're walking with the Lord because they love the Lord. They adore him. They, they desire to worship him. And they gave to him, to the king, because they believed him to be worthy. Christ is worthy of your life. He is worthy of your following him and he is worthy of whatever it is that you bring to him. He is worthy. And then finally, there's one more I want to show you today. His name is Simeon. His story is found in Luke chapter 2, verses, tw verses 25 and goes down from there. I'm going to read verse 25 and then I'm going to read verse uh, 32, 30 and 32. So verse 25, and behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. The same was just and devout. Uh, I'm sorry. The same man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel and the Holy Ghost was upon him. And then now... He, Simeon now gets to see the Lord, the babies come uh, to, the, to the temple to be, uh, 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 to be um, dedicated there. And uh, he sees him. And then in Luke thir chapter 2 and verse 30, For mine eyes have seen thy salvation, uh, which thou hast prepared before the face of all people, a light to lighten the Gentiles, Gentiles and the glory of, the, of thy people Israel. Here's Simeon's attitude was one of anticipation. The Bible says he waited for the consolation. He looked for the answer, the promise of God. He waited for the promise the, of God that the Savior would come. He waited for that promise to be fulfilled. You know, the Bible is filled with passages urging you and me to do exactly that same thing. To look forward to. To wait for. To be anxious for the day when God fulfills his promise and Jesus Christ comes again. Titus chapter 2 and verse 13. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ. Christian, you ought to be looking for his coming. You ought to see it as one of the greatest blessings, the promise of his coming. You ought to wait daily for the promise. Uh, years ago, there was a little uh, phrase, that, a little uh, lapel pen people wore, just said, perhaps today. And it ought to be that you wake up every day and you say, perhaps today. I know uh, some people wake up and say, thank you, Lord, for giving me this day. And that's a wonderful thing. Start out to say, thank you, Lord, for giving me this day. God, would this be, the second thing would, would be wonderful is God, can this be, would this be? Yeah. The day you come for me, the day you call me to heaven. I'm looking forward to his pro the promise of his coming. Second Timothy chapter four and verse eight. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give to me, uh, give me at that day. And not to me only, but unto all them that love his appearing. I wonder if you love his appearing. I know I've told this story years, uh, a lot of times. Uh, years ago when we lived in Astoria, we would listen to, uh, uh, to a radio station down in Astoria. I think it was KPDQ, I believe it was. And it was a Christian radio station. And we'd listen to it on Saturday nights. They had a Saturday night gospel sing. And we'd listen to the Saturday night gospel sing. And, uh, and, then, um, during, and then I'd listen to programs, you know, preachers and things through the, through the days. So until one day um, the announcer got on. He said, here's what I'm going to do today. I'm just going to give you an opportunity just just call in and, and just tell me what, what your beef about your preacher. You know, and so he had a live call in show, just open line, just everyone can call up and call in and tell you what, tell me what you don't like about your preacher. And so, you know, people are doing that, which I think is really crazy to do that anyway. And, uh, you know, I mean, you talk about lightning falling down from heaven. It just seems like that's the right time for that to happen. But uh, 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 they're doing this and all of a sudden this lady calls him. You know what I don't like about my preacher? He keeps talking about Jesus coming again. Can't, why can't he get more positive? And I'll tell you, there's nothing more positive for the believer than that Jesus is coming again. I mean, when you look at the way the world is going today, the Bible doesn't promise us that this world is going to get better and better and better until Jesus Christ comes again. The Bible says the world is going to get worse and worse and worse until Jesus Christ comes again. And I don't know how you think, but it looks to me like this world is getting worse and worse and worse. More and more quickly all the time. And so I'm praying more and more often, Jesus, Lord, come again. And he says, not only, 
uh, you know, when he comes, there will be a crown of righteousness for me, but not only to me, but also to all them that love his appearing. John, 1 John chapter 3 and verse 2. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. What's he saying? He's saying, man, I can't wait for him to come, because when he comes, while I don't know everything about what's going to happen when Christ comes, and I can't tell you everything that's going to happen in heaven, and I can't tell you all that it's going to be to be, uh, you know, uh, uh, in a perfect body. People ask pastors questions like this, you know, well, when I have my perfect body, will I know who my children are? When I have my perfect body, will my wife and I still be able to live in the same house? When I have my perfect body, am I going to have to be a girl married to Jesus? And they'll ask me questions like that, and my, what, what's that? What? Yeah, the people, because, you know, Jesus is the, and the bride of Christ, and are you the bride of Christ? So does that mean that all of us have to become women? I don't want to be no woman in heaven. <laughs> people ask questions like that. And in my head, you know, I try to keep the very, you know, the, the, um, you know, the, the, the pastoral kind of uh, face. You know, and, and uh, I understand. I understand. Yes, I understand. I'm praying for you. In my, in, my, I, I, in my face, I'm trying to do that. In my mind, I'm thinking, what kind of idiot are you? <laughs> I've never thought about that about any of you, I promise you. I've never thought that about any of you. And, uh, and so, come on. John says, we don't know everything about what it's going to be like in heaven. I mean, in my mind, you've heard this. I, in my mind, in my mind, here's, here's how, I'm, and this is all made up. I, there's no Bible, Bible to back this up. And, uh, and, uh, and it probably isn't anything like this. But in my head, when I get to heaven, I'm going to have 40 acres. I'm going to have a house right in the middle of the 40 acres. I'm going to have a stream running through the property. And, I'm going to, and the stream's going to run through the middle of my living room. I'm going to have a lazy boy chair so I can catch trout right out of my living room. And my, that's how I think heaven will be. But I, I don't know. And in my head, you know, so I'm thinking to myself, I, I just know Anita. And I know she's not going to tolerate no trout stream running through the living, middle of the living room. And so I'm thinking, I'm going to have my house. She's going to have her house. And, uh, and, um, and I'll go visit her once in a while at her house. And, uh, and I'll invite her over once in a while. To, I don't know. I, but all that's just, all that's made up. I don't know. But I do know this. When he shall appear, yeah. we shall be like him. Amen. For we shall see him as he is. And I know to be like him will be better than anything that I can dream up. That's what I know. Jesus is coming. He came the, the first time in answer to God's promise. And he's coming again. In answer to God's promise. That's what the word of God says. Now, some are just too busy for Jesus. I'm going to conclude here. Some are just too busy for Jesus today. Some find Jesus a threat to their own desires and what they want for their own life. But some people believe and some people follow and some people wait anxiously for him to come again. I, I wonder what the birth of Jesus means to you.